Hey everyone, and welcome to our first video, which will be in a series of videos detailing um, everything geology. Now, to start the series off, I figured we'd begin with the laws and principles of geology. There will be five we'll be covering in this video, and they're all incredibly simple. So, starting it off, we've got the law of superposition, which was discovered, or named rather, by a guy named William Smith. After naming it, his friends called him uh, Stratus Smith. And basically all that it says is this. If you've got some strata, and strata is just another word for a layer of sedimentary rock. So if you've got some strata, this is what's known as a cross-sectional map here. If you've got, say, three layers, right? This being the surface make it look a bit more surfacey. You've got layer A, layer B, and layer C. Well, the law of superposition simply states that since C relative to A is above it in this cross-sectional view, C must be younger than A and by that same logic B must be younger than A, but older than C, so B is in the middle. And A, since it is at the very bottom, must have been deposited first, and is therefore the oldest. Simple enough, right? Well, these are all just methods of relative dating, so you'll see a trend here when we look at these uh, different strata, they'll all end up with some conclusion saying this one is older than this one, this one is younger than this one, or something to that extent. Now the next one we have uh, was also named by the man William Smith or Strata Smith, and it is called the Law of Faunal Succession or Biotic um, Succession. And as the name implies, we are getting into uh, fossils here. Um, it was originally by most called faunal secession, but it was later more people now call it biotic secession, or it is more properly named biotic secession because faunal, as you may be aware, refers simply to animals. Meanwhile, with biotic, we can include plants in there, the flora. So faunal succession is simple enough as well. If you've got a similar bed of strata, and let's say you've got, um, yeah, we'll just do C down here. Then let's say we've got uh, B and A right here. And we'll have one on top that we'll just call X. And once again, X is at the surface. So C may be very far back in the fossil record, but then let's say we have a little, uh, I don't know, a little ammonite fossil in here. I'll try my best to draw something that looks kind of ammonitic. We've got one that's found in B as well as up further in A. Right? Well, in the real world, we would call these index fossils, and we can say that they can be used to relatively date anything that was found um, within, a, within a relative time period. Um, usually this would be the lifespan of the fossil. So let's just say that this fossil has been around, I don't know, x through y years. Just using variables here, not numbers. Uh, and we'll put that in units of million years ago, or MYA. So we know that from this method, it's a bit different from the law of superposition in that we can't really, it isn't used to say, well, this is younger than this, is older than this, etc. Um, but it's used to say, well, since these two contain the same fossils here, then we can assume that they are both from this time period, from this x through y million years ago time frame. Meanwhile, c uh, combining the law of superposition, since we know it is older than both A and B, we can assume that C comes 
before this fossil existed, uh, before it was evolved, and X comes from a time when fossil is extinct. So what the law of faunal or biotic succession tells us is that these two are from a certain time period. Anything below it, there could be an infinite number of layers down here. That must have come before this fossil existed, before it had evolved, and anything that comes after it or above it up until the surface must be younger than it, and therefore comes from a time when the fossil was extinct. Now moving on, we have the law of included fragments. Now this one sounds a little weird and its name isn't nearly as uh, sophisticated or nice sounding as the rest, but um, it's relatively simple in its premise and I'll draw a similar diagram again. And I'll go into why this occurs in a later video, but if you have, once again, just for the sake of simplicity, C, B, and A. And let's say, uh, we'll distinguish B here, and, you know, because in most cross-sectional maps, uh, there's, a, there's a certain key uh, for all different kinds of rocks. Uh, shale looks a certain way, um, different igneous rocks have different looks to them. Sandstone has, I think, a more brick-like look, don't quote me on that, but... Um, the law of included fragment states that if you see something like this, where you've got little fragments of B inside of A, and this view is incredibly simple. Um, I mean, we wouldn't even need this law. We could just say by the law of superposition that B is older than A. But if there had been deformation, faulting, or folding that had occurred to this particular um, region, and it looked a lot less neat than this, and it wasn't so um, uniform in that it was just three layers directly on top of each other, then we would see that it would be harder to apply the law of superposition. And this would come in handy because we can say, if there is any fragment of B within A, or any fragment of a certain strata within another strata, then the strata that is contained, its fragments are contained within the other one, must be older. So disregarding the law of superposition, pretend we don't know that. We can say, well, since we see this fragment of B within A, we can say that B is older than A. Simple enough. This one is pretty similar to the law of included fragments, um, but it deals much more with what are called igneous intrusions, usually, um, which occur by very different processes than um, fragmentation does. But it is the law of cross-cutting relationships. That's a pretty fun-sounding one. So prior to this, we've been dealing entirely with sedimentary rocks. But if we've got, once again, just three sedimentary strata here, C, B, and A, well, most layers of rock in the real world don't entirely work like this. And you, as you hopefully know, there are three types of rock, sedimentary, metamorphic, and igneous. Uh, metamorphic rocks you'll generally only see in these types of diagrams, either through contact metamorphism, where you'll see small amounts of them, or if you're looking at one that's been around for a while, and you'll see uh, rocks that have been sitting there due to uh, large amounts of heat and pressure. Um, but that's beside the point, because here we're dealing entirely with igneous, um, what are called intrusions. 
so when you've got magma deep beneath the earth, and uh, you, you can have what's called an intrusion. So one of the most common ones that you'll see in pictures like these is, is what's called a dike. Um, it goes straight up. It's generally almost entirely vertical. That's what it is by definition. And it just cuts through the overlying strata here. So we'll call this I. Um, and what this can tell you is that I is, since it cuts through all of these, I must be older. Excuse me, younger than all three. A, B, and C. Because it cuts over them, and you see, if you can see it overlying the other layers, then we know that it must be younger. Uh, the intrusion was an event that occurred after the deposition of A, B, and C. Now if we had a slightly different picture, just to show you what this would look like, where we've got the simple strata bed, and then we've got C, B, and A. But what if instead of cutting through all three of them, we had the intrusion come up after B and C were deposited, and then it reached the surface, what was the surface back then before A was deposited. And afterwards, erosion occurred, and um, we had the intrusion get cut off and just A completely uh, was deposited completely on top of it. Well, that's what this would look like, where we have I, and it cuts through these two, because it occurs, the intrusion of I occurs after B and C were deposited, but afterwards erosion occurs, which flattens the surface here, and then strata A is deposited on top of I. So we can say because of that, that A is younger than I, but I is older than both B and C. Now there's a final law to go into, and that is the, um, it's a slightly different one, and that it deals mostly with events. Um, while we've been detailing, you know, saying this rock is older than that rock, um, this one, the law of original horizontality gives us slightly different information and it simply states that for sedimentary rock when they are deposited they are deposited at close to horizontally so what that tells us is that in a bed where we've got just three layers again C, B, and A. And we can say that no new events have occurred to this bed, or no significant geologic events have occurred within the history of this uh, region of strata. And that is because nothing has occurred to deform the originally horizontal uh, strata of rock. Now, deformation can occur in the form of faulting and folding, and Knowing that, we can say that if we have a, a different kind of structure, not just a uniform bed, but let's say we have an anticline, which um, once again we'll be covering this later as well, but an anticline is folding in rock that occurs such that they are... Sorry about that, I had a small technical difficulty with the camera. But we'll pick up right where we left off. Um, and I was drawing what's known as an anticline, previously having identified how the law of original horizontality would come into play with a completely unaltered 
um, bed of rock. But here if we draw some strata that have been folded, and like I said, this is known as an anticline. Uh, the rocks have been folded such that they, they open upwards, making sort of a U shape here. Uh, the opposite is known as a syncline, but we'll go more into those later. So we'll just label these again, A, B, C, and D down here. And what this tells us is that by the law of original horizontality, since all four of these layers, they're sedimentary rock, they must have been deposited horizontally or close to horizontally. Well, none of these are really horizontal at all. So we can say that the folding must have happened after the initial deposition of all A, B, C, and D. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this goes back to the whole, with the law of original horizontality, you can um, better date um, events rather than, like, the rocks themselves. So we say the deposition of A, B, C, and D um, which means that the folding, the actual folding it, of the rocks itself came after these uh, were first placed. Um, and that's all there really is to the law of original horizontality. Obviously there, are, there can be more difficult examples where you'll have more stuff down here, there may be some flat rocks, there may be some that are uh, folded, you may have multiple instances of folding. Um, Many maps will be much broader than this. This is just to provide you with a most, the most watered-down examples you could possibly have. Um, but if you would like to see some more complex examples, I can certainly do a video on those. Um, but yeah, hopefully this was informative, maybe you learned something new, maybe it was good review. But those are five principal laws of geology in a nutshell. And um, hope you enjoyed, and see you in the next video.